Hi everyone, I'm John Fenzel and we're here at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. I'd like to introduce you to one man whose name is on this wall, Thomas William Bennett. He was an army medic who was killed in action during the Vietnam War on February 11th, 1969. And what's especially notable about Tom Bennett is that he was the second conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. Of course, you've seen the movie, the 2016 film Hacksaw Ridge that told the story of Desmond Doss, who was also a medic in World War II, who was the first conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. Bennett received the medal after repeatedly placing himself in harm's way to save wounded soldiers during operations in the central highlands of Vietnam. He was mortally wounded during one of those actions in Pleiku and received the Medal of Honor posthumously. I could stop there and that alone would be significant enough, but there's much more to Tom Bennett's story to tell. Thomas W. Bennett was sociable and deeply religious. He was raised Southern Baptist, and while he was a student at West Virginia University from 1966 to 67, he formed the Campus Ecumenical Council and served as its president during its freshman year. He was a speaker, facilitator, and a worker. He was also a planner and organizer who liked to bring people together. Throughout his time at West Virginia University, Tom helped write the student code of conduct that remains in effect today. He worked on the 1968 Festival of Ideas Committee, taught Sunday school, led Bible studies in the dormitory where he lived, and he moderated discussions between townspeople and students. He was known for personally helping people in need, and he was genuinely outgoing and interested in others. In fact, Tom was so involved in talking and listening to everyone he came across in a leading on campus that his grades eventually dropped and so he was placed on academic probation after the fall 1967 semester. He could have appealed his probation but instead he left school and there was a big issue with that. He, he knew it. There was a draft on it and in fact there were a number of other issues. His faith had led him to oppose the Vietnam War that would collide with the reality of the draft and his duty to register and to serve. He was deeply patriotic, loved his country, but he couldn't reconcile his faith with the likelihood of killing other people while in the service to his nation. Still, this was all theoretical as long as he had that academic deferral from the draft. Now though, Tom had to face up to the possibility that he could lose his academic deferment, so at that point, he considered his options. With the loss of protection granted by his academic status, he knew he'd likely be drafted. Many of his friends had already signed up or had been drafted and gone to war, including his high school friend, David Kovac, who had been killed in action in Vietnam just three years prior in 1965. Tom had been deeply affected by Kovac's death, so honoring David Kovac's memory was very likely a prime influence upon Tom's decision to enlist as a conscientious objector, but as one who was willing to serve. Now, this classification is different from a conscientious objector who will not assist the military in any way. It's also very likely that Tom was inspired by the example of World War II Medal of Honor recipient Desmond Doss. Doss was a Seventh-day Adventist and he couldn't serve in that capacity which would cause him to kill a person. He set an example of how to serve both faith and country when he successfully petitioned to serve as a field medic, an unarmed position. Similarly, even though raised a Baptist, Thomas Bennett approached his duty with help from a recruitment specialist. He entered service in Fairmont, West Virginia in 1968 and was off to Fort Sam Houston for combat medic training. Before leaving for Vietnam, he wrote a prayer which was often repeated in articles about him after his death. It says, Oh God, shake me from my apathy, from my wanderings of my mind, create in me discipline, concern, and love. Help me live, really live, in spirit and the truth. As those around him would soon see, this prayer really did personify Thomas Bennett. So, Tom was trained as a field medic. He earned a new nickname, and even though during his advanced training he fainted when he got blood taken and forced himself not to throw up when watching a film about wartime medicine, in January 1969, he was called Doc. Tom began writing letters and creating audio tapes to send home nearly as soon as he'd left Morgantown. His accounts offer an inside look of not only military life, but the struggles inside his head and heart as he made his way to war. 
He told himself and the recipients of his mail that it was unlikely he'd become involved in combat because he'd be behind the front lines and his status as a medic would make it less likely that he'd be put directly into harm's way. Tom wrote to his family often of his desire for peace and his hatred of war. In one letter, early in training, he watched 200 men with bayonets screaming kill as they charged positions. God help a world where ordinary young men must become trained killers, he wrote. His letters frequently ended with the word peace written in capital letters at the bottom of the page. He wrote to President Richard Nixon before he shipped out to make sure he knew of his opposition to the war. I will go and possibly die for a cause I vehemently disagree with, he wrote. Tom Bennett arrived in South Vietnam as a private first class on January 1st, 1969. He was assigned to Bravo Company 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry in the Central Highlands of Vietnam near the Chupa Mountain. The battalion was known as the Golden Dragons and it had a long history and lineage dating back to the Civil War. Their regimental motto was the right of the line. In addition to performing his duties as a medic, he also took shifts on perimeter patrol or listening patrol. He referred to it as a listening patrol because it was so dark at night that no one could see very far, so they listened for odd noises that might betray an enemy location. He wrote home that he had not picked up a gun since deployment. In his letters home, he describes the other men in his unit, a new friends and new routines of his day. Sometimes quiet, sometimes explosions were near, sometimes sleepless nights. He described all of it in his audio tapes and his letters. Early on in his letter writing, he was enthusiastic, optimistic, and expanding into his new roles. He wrote to his parents that he had been assigned to Company B, and the next day he was scheduled for a helicopter ride out to meet his new unit. And here's what he said. Tomorrow my journey begins, but when I become a man, I put away the childish things. God help me, love Tom. The area had been quiet, but enemy forces were moving in. The 14th was there to patrol, seek out, and defeat the enemy. They began a series of intensive patrols in the dense mountainous terrain of the Central Highlands. And when the 14th deployed to Chupa, they had to climb that mountain. The diameter of the base of the mountain was about six to eight miles across. The highest of the many peaks was 2,000 feet above sea level. It was densely forested with thick undergrowth, many rocky cliffs, steep slopes, and dark under that canopy. The mountaintop in that season was wreathed in mist and fog until mid-morning, and there was usually fog around the base, especially on the two sides, bounded by a river until mid-morning. Even to a West Virginia mountaineer, it was an impressive piece of terrain. One of Tom's fellow soldiers described it as dark and menacing. Tom described that climb in his letters home. The mountain was very steep and each man was carrying as much as he possibly could. He watched as one man pulled the groin muscle and couldn't go on. And without a word, the men of his units picked up the injured man's equipment and also carried him. Tom wrote, the guys were beautiful. It chokes me up to think about it. And war is a terrible thing. I hate it, yet it seems to bring out the best in men. Now that we've made it to the top, there's very little danger. Many suffered various aches and pains and injuries along the way up that mountain, but for Thomas Bennett, who was 5'6 and slight, this was quite an achievement. On January 24, 1969, less than a month before he was killed, Tom Bennett took out his tape recorder and dictated a letter home to his family in Morganton. He said, I'm somewhere in the great noble land of South Vietnam. At least I hope it's the South. I'm pretty sure it is. He wrote about the cases that he treated. He liked to check on his patients, to ask about the job each man was doing. He wrote about the type of medical care he was asked to render, including treatment for sunburns and cuts and a, even a rat bite. He was encouraged that the men were seeking him out and coming to him from other units. In this letter, he explained that the work that goes into the job of being a medic, his fellow soldiers would leave their boots on for days, leading to all sorts of foot problems, and he was frustrated they wouldn't button their shirts up and roll down their sleeves, leaving themselves open to insect-borne diseases. He said, hopefully tonight we'll be able to straighten that out just a little bit, have some cooperation to get the sleeves down, because I'd like to not lose too many guys to malaria. Three days later, he wrote a letter to his parents about his battle for a better latrine in his unit with burn barrels and wooden seats. Sorry, they said, we don't have any. Sorry, said I, get some. 
The poor captain had to get on the radio and order them on their resupply. I told him it was just as important as food or shells for his darn cannons. We now have a latrine. Tom was an eternal optimist, always trying to learn more and be more while sometimes being discouraged, worried, or afraid. In that first tape, he said, despite all those things that I can say in all honesty that I've never been more confident, more sure of myself, and more at ease with myself. That I like. And if this has to be, and I have to be here, I'm glad that I'm a medic. In honesty, I guess I could say it sort of makes me sick sometimes, this whole thing. My one impression so far is disbelief. I just can't believe the stuff is going on. So that's that. But it's kind of funny, actually. I'm dirtier right now than I've been in my whole life. I'm farther from home than I've been in my whole life. I'm learning more, faster, probably than I've ever learned. And of course, the more you learn, the more you see, and the less concrete everything is in your mind. You begin to see how complex everything really is. Yet he continued, despite the fear, he was more at ease with himself and more confident. At the end of the recording, he says, there are several final things I'd like to emphasize. First of all, and foremost, I'm still safe. Second, I'm ready for death. All the way around, I'm proud that I'm ready. Third of all, and most important perhaps, is how much I really love you. He wrote of his intent to study medicine when he returned home, and from his last tape he dictated home, he urged his mother not to worry, and as he often did, he looked on the bright side. On February 9, 1969, Company B and Company D were screening a ridge along the west side of Chupa Mountain as a two-battalion attack was staged. Company B encountered unexpected terrain in this double canopy jungle. Aerial reconnaissance failed to reveal the steepness of the terrain, the rock faces and the abandoned bunkers in the caves. There had been no sign of the enemy up to that point. Company B advanced into the rock complex, and just as they were clearing it, the entire company came under withering fire from a ridge to their north. The volley of AK-47, machine gun, B-40 rocket, and mortar fire pinned down the company and divided it, but the unit leaders quickly adapted, returned fire, and began reassembling their forces together. Tom Bennett risked his life repeatedly to put at least five wounded men to safety. The enemy fire subsided in the night and the American forces moved to create a landing zone but failed in the attempt to resupply the ammunition. That evening, his platoon sergeant recommended him for the Silver Star. But Tom didn't stop there. Over the coming days, Bennett repeatedly put himself in harm's way to tend to the wounded. At dusk on February 11th, the entire company came under withering fire from the ridge to the north. The company received AK-47 machine gun, B-40 rocket and mortar fire from tunnels and bunkers to the northwest, north and northeast. They were unable to locate the exact positions from which the fire was being received because of the dense jungle growth in the area. Additionally, they received automatic weapons fire from a draw to the south. The company estimated that there were at least seven machine guns employed against them. The initial volley pinned down the company and caused it to be broken up into several separate squads of platoon-sized elements. During the first few rounds, the artillery forward observer was wounded and knocked unconscious. This phase of the battle consisted of a number of individual actions as the small unit leaders responded to each situation. During this period, all available artillery, airstrikes, and gunships were brought in to support the company. The artillery forward observer had regained consciousness and rushed across an open area to an exposed position to direct the artillery fire. He brought fires into within 30 meters of the friendly elements. At least one enemy machine gun took a direct hit as the troops saw pieces of the weapon and the bodies flying through the air. Nearly 600 rounds of artillery were fired during the first hour of this contact. While attempting to reach a soldier wounded by sniper fire, Bennett was killed. He died without ever carrying a gun in training or in combat. Tom Bennett's body was recovered probably the following day on February 12th. And in Morgantown, Tom's family was told that he was missing in action initially. The next week, their worst fears were realized with the confirmation that he'd been killed in action. The announcement appeared in the Morganton Dominion News and the Fairmont Times, but there was no mention of how he died. That would become better known in the coming year. Several West Virginia papers carried the news that Thomas Bennett would be awarded the Medal of Honor in 1970. In honor of the event and in memory of such an extraordinary young man, the Dominion Post ran an article about him that included the letters that he had written home. Now, for every single Medal of Honor to be awarded, there must be eyewitness accounts that describe the actions that justify its awards.
Several eyewitness accounts were written about Tom Bennett's heroism that evening. Tom's platoon sergeant, Sergeant James McBee, said this, Private First Class Bennett left his place of relative safety, rushed through heavy fire, and rendered aid to troops who had been wounded. He picked up one soldier and carried him to safety. On another rescue mission, Tom Bennett was knocked down by the concussive force of a nearby explosion. McBee added that Bennett got back up, ran to the wounded man, and though they were in an exposed position, administered aid until the man was stable enough to move. The account continues with similar descriptions regarding three more men and six more and then one more. Bennett was advised not to go after the remaining one because of the intensity of small arms fire, but he did not hesitate. When he neared the last wounded man's position, he fell to small arms fire, mortally wounded. The same account is written from Sergeant Dominic Tomeo, who warned Thomas Bennett that his life was in danger due to the risk he was taking to treat the wounded, but PFC Bennett fearlessly kept on. Sergeant Smith wrote that Bennett's selfless actions inspired all of us to make us determined to defeat the enemy forces. His extreme bravery during the entire period of time was something you would have to observe in order to realize how really courageous he was. On April 7, 1970, his posthumous Medal of Honor was presented to his mother and stepfather by President Richard Nixon. It was Thomas Bennett's 23rd birthday. His citation reads, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Corporal Bennett distinguished himself while serving as a platoon medical aid man with the 2nd Platoon, Company B, during a reconnaissance and force mission. On 9 February, the platoon was moving to assist the 1st Platoon of Company D, which had run into a North Vietnamese ambush when it became heavily engaged by intense small arms, automatic weapons, mortar, and rocket fire from a well-fortified and numerically superior enemy unit. In the initial barrage of fire, three of the point members of the platoon fell wounded. Corporal Bennett, with complete disregard for his safety, ran through the heavy fire to his fallen comrades, administered life-saving first aid under fire, and then made repeated trips carrying wounded men to positions of relative safety from which they would medically evacuate from the battle position. Corporal Bennett repeatedly braved the intense enemy fire moving across open areas to give aid and comfort to his wounded comrades. He valiantly exposed himself to heavy fire in order to retrieve bodies of several fallen personnel. Throughout the night into the following day, Corporal Bennett moved from position to position, treating and comforting the several personnel who had suffered shrapnel and gunshot wounds. On 11 February, Company B again moved in an assault on the well-fortified enemy positions and became heavily engaged with the numerically superior enemy force. Five members of the company fell wounded in the initial assault. Corporal Bennett ran to their aid without regard to the heavy fire. He treated one comrade and began running toward another seriously wounded man. Although the wounded man was located forward of the company position covered by heavy enemy grazing fire and it was warned that it was impossible to reach the position, he leaped forward with complete disregard for his safety to save his comrade's life. In attempting to save his fellow soldiers, he was mortally wounded. Corporal Bennett's undaunted concern for his comrades, the cost of his life above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the U.S. Army. Tom was also promoted to corporal posthumously. His mother wrote twice after Bennett died to President Nixon to make sure that he understood her son's belief in nonviolence. Now, According to the Selected Service, Bennett is one of three conscientious objectors who received the Medal of Honor in combat. Private First Class Desmond T. Doss served in World War II, and Bennett and Special Support Joseph G. LaPointe Jr., who also served in Vietnam, were the others. Let's visit the final resting place of Thomas William Bennett. He's interred here at East Grove Oak Cemetery in Morgantown. It's not an especially easy grave to find, but we finally were able to locate it toward the back of the cemetery off an access road. A small emblem that you see here below his name signifies the Medal of Honor. His mother and stepfather are buried with him here, as you can see.
His name is here on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall on panel 32 on the West End, line 10. Let's find Tom on the wall. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here in this historic East Room of the White House today for an occasion that is on the one hand a very sad occasion because we are honoring men who have died for their country. But on the other hand, it's a very proud occasion because these are men who have given more to their country than any of us have given and have given it in a way that is commemorated by the very highest honor that this nation can provide, the Medal of Honor. Corporal Thomas W. Bennett, while serving as a platoon medical aid man with Company B, 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry, 4th Infantry Division, during a reconnaissance in force mission in Pleiku Province, Republic of Vietnam, on February 9, 1969. Their conspicuous gallantry, undaunted concern for their comrades, and intrepidity at the cost of their own lives, above and beyond the call of duty, are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit on themselves, their units, and the United States Army. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, on this occasion, incidentally, we want you to know that uh, this House uh, belongs to you, and uh, we, uh, we, we invite you to uh, the extent that your schedules will permit to take a tour uh, of the various rooms in the house, and uh, we have, uh, Mrs. Nixon has arranged for some refreshments over in the state dining room, and uh, we want you to the extent that this, this occasion will permit, we want you to enjoy your visit here and to take away memories of uh, that will be pleasant ones of the White House and of all the things that have happened here. And uh, we want to say again that as we think of this group, there were, as I went around the room, 21 men, and they came from 14 states and from Puerto Rico. That shows you that this is truly one country, that when you find brave men, they aren't limited to one state. They come from all of America, from the whole heart of America. And we thank you again for what you have done, as well as what, for what they have done. 